Thanks for joining me today on Grip Machine DNA. I'm joined today by Sergeant Major Kyle Lamb. This guy is a force of nature. I've been following him for several years, and I'm just honored to have him on our show today. Sergeant Major, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, David. It's, a, it's an honor to see you again. You too. Well, let's get right started. Part of what we do at Grip Machine DNA, Kyle, is we try to inspire people, uh, first of all, to embrace American values, second, to understand of resilience, the importance of faith, family, and leadership, and determination in their lives. Um, you embody all those things to me, and so I want to talk through that uh, first about you, and then second about leadership. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about, uh, about your book, Leadership in the Shadows, and some of those themes that really stood out for me. So okay. we're going to dive right in. Who are you? Oh, man, that's a... <laughs> Uh, I have no idea. I'm still trying to figure that out. I, uh, I'm a kid from South Dakota that grew up on a dirt farm. Um, we, <laughs> I'm second generation American. So my mom and dad were both the first Americans, the first kids born in America to our family. And uh, yeah, my dad was a farmer. My mom was a, a farm wife, a mom and, and a grandma and everything. And, and that's how I grew up. So I, I, I went in the army, I guess, because I was lazy. I didn't want to be a farmer. <laughs> and uh, once I joined the military, I really realized that I'd found my tribe or I'd found that group of people that I really wanted to be with. And after that, it was just like wide open. I got married a few weeks before I left for the military. So that was kind of crazy because we got married very young. Um, a lot of folks back home thought we had to we had to get married, but the gestation period was very slow. If that was the case, because our daughter wasn't born until a couple of years later. But I was really blessed to to marry Melinda, who you've met. Um, married her, and we got started with our our time in the military, and we both had to start growing up at that point. So, grew up in the army. I mean, really grew up. I thought I was grown up before that, but really grew up. Started out in the eighty second as a paratrooper. Um, and then after, sorry about that. Let me shut my phone off here. Yeah, it's okay. The, uh, joined the 82nd was a paratrooper. There was a communications guy. So I carried a radio on my back. That was my job marching around with the infantry dudes, but they were doing kind of what I wanted to do, but I was the, I was the radio guy. Then after that, I went to, uh, try out for special forces or green berets as they call them a lot on TV, uh, did that and was selected to become a special forces communications sergeant so one of the there's two combo guys on every operational detachment in special forces so that's that was the job i was trying to train up to be the first thing i had to do was learn morse code <laughs> because at that time we were still using hf radios high frequency radios laying out long antennas long wire antennas or uh, uh, dipole antennas that we would cut you know um, learning how to do that correctly so that you could transmit around the world. Cause literally at that time, you know, if you jumped in somewhere, that was your lifeline was the commo guy talking around the world back to where you needed to be. And with that HF, we could literally talk around the world. That sounds crazy. Uh, cause now we're using satellite communications, which you can talk around the world easily because you're talking via satellites, but this day and age, it kind of makes me wonder what's going to happen if we do get in a a global battle and all those satellites that are owned by other countries, if they shut them off to our use, you might be seeing some special forces guy that old guys like me might have to fire up remembering how to do some dits and some dashes there and, <laughs> and uh, start using HF radios again. So a lot like what you'll see with ham radio operators, that's kind of what we were, what we were doing. So I did that. I was actually in, I made it through the special forces qualification course. I was in Arabic language school, learning to, uh, Bit Kalam Adabi and Saddam Hussein invaded, and I knew that I was going to be headed to Desert Shield, Desert Storm. So, went to Fifth Special Forces Group at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and then quickly over to De Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Did that for six months, come back, kind of realized that um, I wasn't that I wasn't really enjoying what I was doing. Mm. I knew there because I knew there were bigger and better things that I could do maybe not bigger, but definitely better for me. So I decided to take the opportunity to try out for uh, Delta at that point. 
and went to selection and was selected in the fall of 1991 to go uh, to the unit, uh, did that and spent all but one year of the rest of my time in the military there at the unit. And there I did everything from being an assaulter to a, a sniper to an assault team leader, sniper team leader, primary shooting instructor, uh, instructor for many other things too, but primarily the shooting instructor as we're putting guys through training. And then I was a troop sergeant major. I did that. I did five tours to Iraq uh, for the current war with them. Kind of going back, uh, there were other things we did. We did a lot of stuff in Bosnia during the that conflict, Bosnia, Croatia, and those areas. And then also in 93, I went to Somalia uh, for the whole Black Hawk Down incident. I was there for that and was lucky enough to to learn a lot without getting getting killed or wounded on the battlefield there. So that's pretty much it in a nutshell. I mean, I've done a lot. I've, I've seen history in the making and it's, I don't know, I've been very, very blessed to be able to one, meet the people that I've met, two, to have a mission in life that has been very, very important to me and motivated me. And then the other thing is I've been able to successfully transition from being in the military to being a civilian, dirty, nasty civilian, I guess. Um, that's not an easy transition for, for guys like me. Yeah. And I'm, I've been very lucky that I've been able to do that and have, have good success there. And I'm still learning, you know, that's, that's something I know we talked about when yeah. we sat down for, for supper there the night before I spoke up at your event yeah. and man, I'm always learning, listen to what you guys are talking about. It, it, you know, it was motivating for me to hear other like-minded people that are completely different than me. And that's good because um, I just talked about this to somebody else a couple of days ago about your tribe. And a lot of times people want to think that their tribe is people that are just like them, yep. man, it's, it, it's nothing like that. Yep. Your tribe are people that are like-minded very broadly. Yes. You know, and I'll even go a step farther. Um, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't apply to religion either because I have friends that are all kinds of different religions. I had Malaysians that come out and tried to save our lives when we were in Mogadishu. They're all Muslim. And how can you not love those guys? They're, they're putting their lives on the line to come out. They're, they're part of our tribe. You know what I mean? Um, and I think that's, that's one of the, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll stop right there. Cause I don't want to get too no, far. Good. I mean, look, this is, um, we just gave a major broad stroke of who you are and what you've done. So we're going to unpack all that um, over the next uh, few minutes. So I want to go back to something you said, you were, you were the firstborn in America. Where's the second? Yeah. Yeah. Se yeah. Second. So my mom, and dad were both born here. And then I was, then I was, so I was the second generation. I'm sorry where, if I where's said that wrong. From? So my mother's family is all from Sweden. And then my dad's family is all from England, but they're from Northern England. So that's a, a, a very prime uh, route for the Vikings to raid England over and over and over again. Absolutely. And we joke about that, but really my family up there, and I didn't know this till a few years ago, but they, they grew up or seven of my grandfathers, as far back as we can go, were born within about 12 to 15 miles of Hadrian's wall. Wow. So if you're familiar with that, uh, yes. Hadrian built that, yep. he didn't build it, but you know, the Romans built that wall and it's, it still stands to this day. They had toilets that flushed when it rained the toilets. I mean, it's, it's crazy what they had designed there. And, uh, yeah. And I, I'll tell you when I went to England, and I've never been to Sweden, but my, my, my daughter did a study abroad there. My wife and son have been there. I will tell you this. I am so glad that they came to America because it gave us this opportunity that we have nothing wrong with England, nothing wrong with Sweden, but man, no question. <laughs> yeah. America's a, we're so lucky to be yeah. uh, where we're at. You know, we're yeah. lucky. My grandpa on my dad's side, they, his, my, um, my great grandpa and my grandma there, they were told that if he didn't get better in another day, he was going to get thrown overboard. So he was like six years old. If he wouldn't have recovered from whatever ailment he had, yeah. I mean, that would have stopped at least, you know, my side of the family there. Um, 
but there's a lot of lambs. They all moved up to South Dakota. Yeah. Um, my other grandpa, he was a carpenter. He came over when he was 19 years old. And just when I think about what they did, they gave up everything they had yep. to come to this dream location. They never, they didn't know what they were really getting into and they weren't coming here to get out of work. Yep. You know, they were coming here for a new opportunity. No um, and man, we're lucky. I mean, look what we've, what we've been able to do with, with what we have. I, I mean, not just yeah. you and I, but just yeah. our families and all the families around yeah. us, the opportunities that, that we have every yeah. day to be successful yeah. here. Totally agree. When people say that, um, we're going to talk about this later, but when people tell me that certain people here are privileged, I said, I tell, I pause them immediately. I said, no, no, no. If you live in the United States of America, you are privileged. I don't care what color you are. I don't care what ethnicity you are. You're privileged. Yeah. So yeah. uh, that we're going to talk a little bit more later about perspective on that. Um, Kyle, you, you said it half jokingly, you went into the army because you didn't want to be a farmer. I want to I want to talk a little bit about that because you essentially made a decision as to what you did not want to be and what you might want to be. How did that how did that happen? So I was always into adventure. So, you know, I would go out in the middle of winter literally crawl in the snowbank and, you know, hunt deer that way and in the summers I was breaking horses and rodeoing and and going out and shooting gophers and everything I did I it was kind of an adventure. I played sports, I did all that, but sports weren't really, I mean, they were, that was fun. It was good, you know, but I really enjoyed when I shot with the air rifle team because it was a challenge. I, you know, I'm getting beat by these girls that could outshoot me and I never could beat them because they were just really, really good. Yeah. And so the guns, the shooting, the innovation of trying to design new products, which a lot of guys think that the first thing I designed was the VTAC sling, which it might've been, I found a, a a sling that I'd made when I was a little kid, literally a little kid. Wow. And I had taken a waistband out of my mom's um, pantyhose and I'd made a sling out of it. I still have it. I still have it connected to this little, this little BB gun I had. So I liked, I, I just liked the whole thought about the military. Yeah. Of course, there was this movie that had come out Rambo, you know, first blood, the first movie, yeah. which if, if the folks that are listening, if, if you enjoy the movie, you should read the book because the book and the movie are completely different. They have different endings and everything. Yep. And that movie spoke to me because I'm like, man, this, I want to be that guy. If, if you learn how to do all that stuff in the military, I want to be that guy. I rode motorcycles. I rode horses. I shot, I did everything. I had the weird hairdo. I had it all, you know? And, uh, so I, I felt like when I, maybe being lazy wasn't the right term that I should have used. What I should have said probably is I, I had a hard time focusing. Um, my attention span is not, <laughs> is not real good. So sitting on a tractor is difficult. I mean, it's, it, it, maybe it's not difficult down here in the South where I live now, but up in the North, when you get on a one round of corn, it might take you an hour go in one direction to turn around and drive another hour at three miles an hour for it, it is just mind numbing for me. Some people eat that up. And, and I'm, I mean, I'm very uh, proud of farmers for what they do. Yes. I'm just not one of those guys. I did like everything that we did with making hay and then anything that dealt with horses and, and the cattle. I really like that, yeah. but I just decided that uh, I wanted to try something different. Um, I come from a very, very small town, Willow Lake, South Dakota, which is, they say, they say 350 people. I think they're kind of making it up because it's, wow. there's not that many people there, wow. but you know, everybody. And that was the other thing, you know, how do you get away? How do you get away from that? The only way in the, for us up there in the Midwest to get away from it is to go to college or go in the military. And after getting out of high school, there was absolutely no way I was going to go to college. Yeah. Um, I love learning, mm. but there's college was not something that was on my list whatsoever. So fascinating. That makes sense. Yeah. So you were, I'm sort of trying to lay this out for people, right? There was an intentional decision about what you embraced and really were interested in. And there was a decision about what you definitely are not interested in. And so you pursued it with passion. Um, I love that about, right? That's sort of like, it helps to make how you think about decision-making. What are my choices? What are my options? What should I pursue? So I love that. 
Um, what were some of, who were the biggest influencers in your life early on pre-military experience? Probably my dad. Mm. My mom was a good gal too, but my dad was yeah. like a, my dad was a, a, a special person. Mm. Um, my dad was born in 1911. And I was born in 1968. You do the math. He was old when I was born. Wow. And my dad was a guy that, I mean, if you didn't like my dad, there was something wrong with you. Cause he was just a good dude, a hardworking guy. He had been married before and his first wife had died of staph infection. Mm -hmm. So all my brothers and sisters on both sides are half brothers and sisters. So that's kind of weird. So my dad ended up meeting my mom who had lost her husband and they got married and I'm the only kid from that marriage, but my dad, and I think, you know, some of this has taken a few years to sink in because mm. your parents will drive you crazy. That's, <laughs> that's what they're supposed to do. But along that, along that route of driving you crazy, they teach you a lot of life lessons that you may not understand for a few years. So for all you kids out there that if you're listening to this, I would tell you to have a little patience with your mom and dad, because yes. most parents want nothing but the best for their kids. Okay. My dad was that same way. He wanted me to have a better life than he had, which I have had. Um, that doesn't mean he wanted it to be easy. I mean, we did, we worked really, really hard. We, we ran a, a big trap line and trap muskrats and mink and, and fox and, there weren't a lot of coyotes in our area, but we, but we'd catch Fox every now and again, they were worth a lot of money. Mink were worth about 60 or 70 bucks oh. when I was a kid. So those, those were, a, if you caught one of those, you were pretty yeah. happy. Even raccoons that we, we uh, either trapped or killed, we could get pretty good money for them. Um, that's hard work. I mean, it's, but it's, it's like Christmas, my buddy in Montana, Chase, he says, yeah, trapping's like Christmas. You go out to check your traps and you don't know what you're going to get. <laughs> and you get there, it's like, oh, I caught a wolf. Oh, I caught, you know, whatever. So, uh, yeah, my dad was a, a, he was a really big influence on me. And then there was a, another guy that was almost like my dad, a guy named John Cone. I call him Johnny Dog. So he was old enough to be my dad. He had a daughter that was in school with me and he had been in the military. He had been a law enforcement officer. He had done a lot of different things. He, the mechanic work on the buses he he did it all but he liked to shoot and i like to ride horses so i would help him with his horses and then he would load ammo for me and here i am hanging out with this older dude so sometimes he'd drive the buses to our track meets or to football games or whatever and i would just man i loved hanging out with this guy because his stories were just his first of all he's a great storyteller and his stories are just they're just wonderful so um how many of them are true? I don't know, but, uh, oh, he's just an amazing storyteller. So when my, my dad passed away when I was in the military mm. and him and John and his wife started helping my mom out. And mm. at that point, you know, when I retired from the military, he brought my mom down to see me retire. Wow. And, um, my mom wasn't as old as my dad. She ended up passing away a couple years ago. She was 93. I think when she passed away, my dad was 88 when he died. Oh. So John really jumped in there and started to be and and this, I'm, I'm kind of going around about here to kind of come yeah. back to this, but I looked up to this guy when I was a kid, but what happened to him later on made me pretty much drop all of that and look up to him to elevate him five or six steps up from where he'd been. So about 10 years ago, his wife had a major stroke. Mm. And when Janine, John's wife, uh, Janine had a stroke, it, she, he became her almost sole caregiver. They had kids, but the kids oh. weren't as involved. So he was, he was the caregiver. So he was feeding her. He was clothing her. He was oh. helping her in the bathroom. He was helping, you know, wash her, do all this stuff. And he did that for up until about six months ago, she actually passed away. Wow. But this guy was very much like me. He's an adventure guy. He's always out shooting or hunting or fishing or whatever. And yeah, honey, just do the work and, you know, I'll be home for supper and whatever. And, uh, 
man, when his wife had that happen, he put all that aside and he focused on only taking care of his wife. Oh. So it, it, he became a perfect example for me as a man, as a father, as a grandfather, as a husband to follow. If this guy who was wilder than I was can do this, it's something I should make sure I do before my wife gets in a situation where that's happening. Now, <clears throat> one other thing I want to say about, about some of these guys, my dad was a Christian. And we went to church, you know, not every Sunday, but very, very regularly. John Cone was raised in a orphanage in Georgia. He saw his mom die when he was about three years old and they put him in this orphanage and he started going to church. And the only reason he started to go to church was because that's the only way he could see his sister. Wow. So they were separated in this orphanage. If he wanted to see his sister, and sometimes that's all it was, he'd see her on the other side of the church. And couldn't, you know, they were very, very, very strict in Southern Georgia back in those days. Um, he did it simply to see his, his older sister. Wow. Then he started hearing like, now what's this Jesus thing? What's this about? And he's like, wait a minute. And I don't know if you've ever heard me say this, but I, if you've heard this, this came directly from John Cohn. He said, uh, one day I was talking to him, he goes, um, man, I said, John, how do you deal with this sometimes taking care of mom? I mean, this is a lot of work. And I mean, what do you do when you get mad or whatever? And he goes, well, sometimes I just got to go out and, and stare at a rock for a while. And he said, he would just go and, and he's serious, like go outside and just stare at a rock for 10 minutes and then get over it and go back and get in back in the fight. But the other thing he said, he goes, and sometimes I talk to Howard and I'm like, Howard. And he goes, boy, don't you read the Bible? And I said, yes, sir. I read the Bible. And he goes, it says right in that book, Howard be thy name. And we laugh about that, oh, but man. let me tell you, it, it really, really will hit you if you think of it that way. And I've got another buddy of mine, Duke Krager. He says, mm. if you want to have a conversation, you can talk to God at any time. And he's your best friend. Oh. And if you look at, at that as Howard, and I'm not being disrespectful because yeah. I'm sure that when God hears that, he's laughing like crazy yeah. too. Um, but but that's what he's saying. He's saying that he, this little kid that grew up in an orphanage in Georgia, he doesn't need to go to see the pastor, the priest, or whoever. He can talk directly to Howard yeah. and sort through the issues he's having. And 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 since then that's kind of become my thing, you know, guys are, I, I'll, I deal with a lot of military dudes. Yeah. And I mean, we've all struggled, we've all fallen, it's, we've, we've trying to claw back in there and, and, and be forgiven. But if, if you'll just take that minute and think of it in that perspective, it's, it's ve been very, very good yeah. um, for me. There was, um, there were other guys around, there were guys that shot with me, I would say that my, my coaches for sports, were not very, they didn't have a lot of influence mm. on me because they, they were, they were, we just didn't really think alike, I guess yeah. is the bottom line. But I had a guy that was a shop teacher, mm. a guy named Kendall Thompson, who is also friends with John Cohn. That we, I was we need, talking we need about. Kyle, we need to explain what shop is. Yeah. So shop classes, you go to this class and you learn everything from how to build a corn planter yep. to how to weld, how to build a building, how to wire. Yep. I mean, I, I still use the skills that Kendall Thompson taught me. I use those skills, not every day, but I use them every week for sure. I mean, if I fire up a saw now, my dad showed me this stuff too, <laughs> but we, we would go to school and we would make stuff. We would start fires with this, you know, we did, we had all kinds of craziness going on, but Kendall was very supportive of me to try different things. I mean, I made knives in shop class, which, oh my goodness, people would freak out about that. Um, and then he was a guy that would rope with me and be my roping partner. So I would head and he would heal at some of these, these, uh, get togethers, these jackpot roping events. And, and he was just a very, a very good guy. And he was a man's man. He's like six foot seven. I believe he's wow. a big, big dude. Wow. And he was just, he was just awesome. So, wow. um, 
there's one other guy and and i had i had some female teachers i had mrs katinger that was an awesome teacher too she was probably my favorite of all of them but she was my favorite because she taught us stuff and she was nice she wasn't evil like some of the other the other <laughs> teachers were but there was a guy named john kinder and mr kinder um what really struck me about him and makes me and and he actually reached out to me several years ago he said hey i saw this video of this guy and he has a lot of the he moves and talks very much like a kid i had as a student named kyle lamb from willow lake is that the same guy wow. and i'm like hey yeah mr kinder it's me and by the way i've written some books can i send them to you roger that so i sent him a couple books and a couple months later i'm like hey did you get the books yep what'd you think of them <laughs> they were fine I mean, he's the English teacher, so he was, he probably didn't look at my books as, as, as good as I should have done. Well, what he did was though, he took a bunch of kids that were completely different. Yeah. So we had one kid in our class that was, um, he was always kind of dirty and he rode a motorcycle all the time, had a dirt bike. Yeah. And that was basically his life. Like he'd get up, ride his dirt bike to school go to school, get on his dirt bike. He didn't play sports, didn't do any of that stuff. Um, and Mr. Kinder was like, okay, for your presentation that you're going to do in public speaking, what are you going to talk about? Well, I don't know. You know, he's kind of kicking rocks. And Mr. Kinder goes, what about your motorcycle? Yeah. And he goes, I can talk about that. And he goes, talk about it. You can use it for part of your demonstration. And he's like, really? He goes, yeah. So you want to go, he goes, no, no, bring your motorcycle wow. into my classroom. Wow. So he had this kid bring his, I mean, this is awesome. Wow. So this kid pushes this dirt bike into this classroom. He inspired that kid Absolutely. to be what he wanted to be. Yep. He didn't put everybody in the same category because we're not the same. Exactly. Contrary to what a lot of people think, yep. everybody's different we're all different. Yep. So how can you take a kid and inspire them yep. so that in what's, what's the life lessons that he learned there? Well, hopefully he learned that everybody's different and everybody can, I mean, if all we've got to do is find a place that you're motivated, like, like you said, you know, I didn't, I luckily I found the military yep. that motivated me. You know um, I told you earlier that I've got the same attention span as a squirrel <laughs> nowadays. What do they do with kids like that? They drug them up, they drug them, they drug them so that they lose their creativity. Yep. If you lose, lose your motivation, and your creativity, you will not be successful. No question. But if you have ADHD or any of those, guess what? It's like a superpower. Yes. It really is. Yep. Um, if you look at these guys that are, are extremely successful just in America, most of them have, they have, <laughs> yeah, there's something wrong with them. Uh, <laughs> The, that's what the doctors would say. Yep. But in reality, they're very, very, very yeah. successful. They're very, very smart people. So yeah. anyway, so that those I, I, I want to go back to something you talked about a little bit. So influential people, your father, um, the gentleman that talked about faith, uh, Howard, uh, yeah. teachers, uh, shop class, I had shop class, I think I was probably one of the last ones in Massachusetts shop class. But <laughs> I want to go back to two different pieces. One, one was faith. And one of the things that I really loved about how you described uh, his relationship um, was we talk about many folks get stuck on religion. And I, I like to encourage people to have a relationship with Christ because it's not religion. And I love how you laid it out. Um, how, how has faith played a role in your life? I mean, you, were, you, you saw some dark times. You saw good times. Was faith important? Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I, I don't remember not having faith. Yeah. Now what I, what I'm, I, what I want everybody to understand is that doesn't mean you're a good, like you're always good. Yeah. That doesn't mean that you don't get in trouble. That doesn't mean that you haven't done bad things that you're not proud of. That doesn't mean any of that. It yeah. means that when, when you finally crawl out of that hole and get on your knees and you say, all right, I need some forgiveness. Yeah. It's there. Yeah. So I'm, my wife and I talk about this quite a bit <clears throat> when my wife is very religious. So 
she, she knows the Bible better than I do. And I've, I'm trying to learn more, but one of the things that she often tells me is she says, you need to be where God sends you. If that means that you need to go to church, then that's fine. If you need to go that there to get, to fill up your cup, then by all means do that. But I look at that and I, my daughter, I was at church with her here a few months ago and, um, her pastor said, you should look at church like being in the locker room. You go to the locker room to get ready for the big game. That's right. So you go in the locker room and you draw some X's and O's up on the board and you have the coach give you a, you know, the coach being your pastor kind of give you a, a slap on the butt or, or motivational speech or whatever. And then you go out of the locker room onto the field. And for us, the field is the real world. Yep. And that's where it's really, really important. So I've taken that a step further and I, I make that, I'm like that, that's relates to me, but I don't like sports analogies because being in a combat is not like playing a football game. No, Not, I mean, what's his name? The, um, the Gipper. Um, oh, what was that? Um, the Gipper Lombardi. Oh, Vince Lombardi. Vince Lombardi. He would give yeah. these speeches, these great speeches about it's combat and all this. Yeah. It's not. I mean, I, I love the speeches, but it's it's not. So when I think about it, I try to put it in a perspective that relates more to me and the guys I'm going to talk to. And that is you're in the team room. And if you're in the team room, there's other things you do as well. You you train, you plan. I mean, all that happens before you go out to conduct a mission. Yeah. So when I talk to guys now, just this is just something recent that I've kind of put together. And it, it helps me be able to talk to young men and women that I'm out there on the range with or whatever. But my wife basically said, be where you need to be. Yeah. And for me, I don't need to be in church. If I need to be there, go there. But where I need to be, if I'm going to help other people is I need to go to them. Yeah. I need to go on the range because they're not going to go to church because they've got this Debbie Downer thing about religion. Yeah. And to be honest with you, I kind of have that too. But I don't have that about Christianity and my faith and talking to God because I've talked to him all along the way when, when things were bad, I'm like, all right, Lord, just get me through this and you know, we'll get to the next step. But uh, yeah, I think faith has a big face, a big deal. And when I talk to veterans or I talk to guys that are getting ready to get out of the military, we always end up talking about faith wow. because they might be talking. And, and that's one of the other things too, hmm. as a, as a senior guy, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I was a senior guy in the military because I was a sergeant major. I couldn't go any higher. Yeah. And now that I'm out, I'm senior to these guys that are getting out because I've been out longer than they have. Yeah. And I've learned a lot of these lessons. I w 15 years ago, I was, I wasn't like I am right now. Mm. I have, I've changed a lot in the last 15 years in the military. I didn't, I wasn't, well, I was outspoken, I guess, but I wasn't quite I wasn't like I am now. I was, I, I didn't speak as openly as I do now because then everything I did was top secret right. or at least secret yeah. <laughs> or at least no form. You know what I'm saying? So I couldn't, I, I couldn't tell anybody what I was doing. Yeah. Um, now that I'm out, I can, I can talk to these guys and say, Hey, listen, you're getting out of the military. You're struggling because you're, you're full of anger. So your anger is making you be pissed off at your wife or your husband. And then yeah. you're, you're drinking. And I don't know, I don't know where, where you think that's going to lead to success, but, um, and it's hard because all these, not all of them, but a lot of these veterans organizations, guess what they do? They bring a bunch of guys together and they go, Oh, let's have a toast. Let's have a beer. Let's do this. It's like, are you kidding me? Yeah. These dudes, the last thing they need is a beer. Yeah. They need to, you know, be with their buddies and talk about that, but don't, don't man, don't take a depressant, you know, show up and be like, man, I'm really sad. Let me drink a beer. Cause that's going to, that ain't going to help, bro. No question. You know? Yeah. It's not yeah. going to help. So, and I don't care if people drink, that's fine. But I just don't think that it's responsible for me to bring other veterans and then say, Oh, by the way, here's some liquor. Yeah. You know? I, I, I appreciate your comments, Kyle. I mean, one of the things that I tell my kids and my nieces and nephews and anyone who will listen is that I, you know, one of the things that I fundamentally believe is missing in America today is faith. Uh, we've taken God out of schools. We've taken God out of work. We've taken God out of our day-to-day -day lives. And 
when you lose that foundational element, uh, uh, the, the fundamental place of peace and truth, uh, a lot of ugly can happen. So I appreciate your comments. Um, I want to, before we talk about leadership, we're going to get to your book, Leadership in the Shadows, because I love this freaking book. Um, <laughs> I do, man. I, I, I'm like your biggest disciple out here. Oh, you got to read this book. So um, I want to talk about your companies. How, how did you, one of the, again, we got to inspire folks to think about self-reliance. Um, the dependency on government is killing me, right? As a Hispanic American who has worked his way to success, um, I encourage people do not depend on government, right? Become self-reliant, use your money to make money, et cetera. I want to just talk a few minutes about how did those companies' ideas come to you? You were in military service at the highest levels for years. How did that happen? How did you get the inspiration to say, we're going to start companies now? So I'm going to steal a saying from a guy that owns a company called Tesla. What's that guy's <laughs> name? Some, he's some famous dude. I, I, honestly, I can't think of his name right now. Um, the rich guy. He oh, paid 11. Tesla. Yeah, what's the, what's, uh, he paid 11 billion dollars in 2021 for taxes. Elon Musk. Yeah, yeah, Elon Musk. He said somebody asked him how do you take entrepreneurs and motivate them? And he's like if you're an entrepreneur you don't need to be motivated. Hmm. And that really hit me because when I started thinking about what I was going to do when I got out of the military I knew I was going to do shooting instruction. I was going to do that because I love to do it. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's hard work. It's very, yeah. it's, it's highly mentally draining, Yeah. but I knew that that was going to be something that I can do and I could make a living doing it. Mm. If you want to be a, a rich dude, I don't, I, I can't help you, Yeah. but if you want to make a living, I mean, all you got to do is do a couple things. The first one is work hard. So no matter what job you have, if you work hard, you're going to be successful. Yep. The, it's the days of aristocracy and, and peasants. We left that behind in England. Okay. So we, we don't have that anymore. You can work hard, no matter what it is, claw your way up through middle management and you will be successful. That's one thing. The other thing is if you're lucky enough to do what you love, then do that. Yep. Find a, find the job that you love to do. Everybody's different. And I can tell you right now, Special forces guys yeah. don't love to do what I do. Mm. Special forces guys don't love to teach people to shoot. Yeah. They may think they do, but there's yeah. only a few of us that truly love to be on the range that much and put up with all that crap of getting yeah. rained on or hailed on or whatever. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely, I, I love it. Now that doesn't mean I don't get tired and upset sometimes, but I get to do what I love to do. Um, some people, I believe, and I just, I just heard a, a veteran say this, and it, it, it was upsetting to me. He said, well, that guy got a break. I, I just need a, you know, I just need a break like that guy. Yeah. And the guy he was talking about was a, a, a friend of the, the two of the three of us were sitting there and two of us know the guy he was talking about. And the one, the other guy knows the guy very, very well. I know him just through talking to him on the phone, his mom committed suicide and he was in this just this guy and you're telling me that he got a break Oof. dude shut up wow you don't need a break you need to work hard if you work hard you're going to be successful and that's why that guy was successful yep. his mom killed himself and and it was really bothering him and he thought about the same thing and what did he do he started making a knife every day. Every single day he'd make a knife. Now he sells those knives for two, three thousand dollars a piece, and he's still making one every day. This guy is just crushing it. He's a Hawaiian dude, Neil Kamamura. People should definitely check him out. He's a really, he's a he's a really, really good dude. Wow. Now I would I would like to caveat some of this stuff. When when I when I say people are really good, that doesn't mean they're not rough around the edges. So when guys hear me talk sometime, they're like, man, I can't believe you said that. Yeah. What do you mean? You can't believe I said that. Why not? Well, you're in church. It's like, yeah, I said something that's the truth. So 
<laughs> why can't I say that? I'm not cussing or whatever, you know, I'm just, I speak very openly to people. Um, I'm not politically correct. You know that yep. you've seen me speak yep. and I'm not being not politically correct for shock and awe. I'm doing it for honesty yeah. because men and women both need to put that political crap behind us, po yeah. political correctness, and just say what's really the truth. I mean, do you want your children to go to school and be taught critical race theory? Yep. No, no, absolutely not. So if every parent that believed the way that you do stood up and said that, guess what? It would, you could shut that down, but there's a lot of parents who are like, oh, I don't want to say anything or, oh, I'm going to get in trouble, which now you see, you know, parents speaking up and they get arrested or whatever. Indiana just passed a law where they can red flag law. Yeah. Scares the crap out of me. The, the law states that police can come to your house without a search warrant if somebody turns you in as you're mentally you know dangerous at this point yeah so think how bad that is we're we're, we're leaving the constitution behind and rights of our citizens in this country which i have fought for and seen my buddies die for and and they're just taking that and just throwing that by the wayside so um sorry i kind of went off on a tangent there but if we if if we would all stand up and just be one accountable for our own actions and then tell people what we really thought, not this whole, Oh, I can't say that. Cause they'll be offended. Yeah. Well, part of what I love about what you're saying is three parts, right? You, you took ideas, you worked hard and you made them work, right? Number one, number two, you were pretty blunt and transparent about the positions you were taking and why you were creating the products you were creating. Yeah. And number three, you had a skill and you leveraged that regardless yeah. of people's opinions. And so to me, it's a lesson for young people to understand, look, if you believe in something, stand up for it. Number one, number two, work hard. Number three, to talk a little bit about the climate we're in today, culture, et cetera. Look, as people who enjoy firearms, um, this has become so politicized. You know, I live in Massachusetts, you know, you can't even talk about firearms here. Yeah. Um, and, and people think it's all about shooting. It's not. Some people do it for sport. Some people do it for self-defense. Others do it because they enjoy it. And so when you think about the, diff, the we're talking about leadership, entrepreneurship, values, this is a, another part of those values we care about. Unfortunately, some folks have chosen to politicize it. And it's, um, it's unfortunate, but you and I are both outspoken people and we'll work through it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, you you live behind enemy lines up there in Massachusetts. <laughs> I every pretty much every single gun I own is illegal there. I probably have a couple that I could I could use legally there. But yeah, it's it's crazy. Uh, the rights that have been violated in in your state, especially. I mean, it's it's uh, it's sad, too, because when you think about who came from that state, the some of the founding fathers, you know, Sam. Yeah. Sam Adams and John Adams and yep. and uh, it's crazy the Cap way Cap things... Captain Parker the shot heard around the world the Minutemen <laughs> yeah yep it's crazy yep well, yeah it's crazy I'm gonna dive right in Kyle I have to ask you leadership in the shadows um, it is a book that I continue to recommend both to many of my friends and also online when people ask me about leadership. I'm going to give you my piece on what I believe leadership is. We'll talk about that later, but I want to first sort of ask you and give context to the, to the listeners and viewers. Um, I want to start with, why did you write this book? Um, I, I kind of got forced into doing a presentation and I decided to call it leadership in the shadows because I always kind of lived in the shadows uh, in the military. You know, we do stuff at night. We were, it was just, it just kind of made, it just kind of made sense, you know? And uh, when I got shamed into doing that, I did that seminar for many years and I had a air force or air force. He's going to kill me for saying that <laughs> a, a naval, naval aviator buddy of mine, Matt Busella, he called me up and, and he'd call me Sparky. He's like, Hey, Sparky, how's that book coming along? And I'd go, I'm, I'm, I haven't done anything. He's like, you need to get on that book. You need to get that book going. He's a cop down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. He's oh. a very, very good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And he just, he, he, he shamed me into writing that book. Oh. So when I, um, 
when I decided to finally listen to him so he would leave me alone, I started writing and he helped me. He helped me in that process because I'd written a couple of books, but writing a leadership book is more difficult than writing an instructional book. Um, what I needed from him was honesty. And I'll tell you what, I got honesty times 12 from him. So when he would read something, he would, he shot straight with yeah. me. And that's what I needed because I wanted it to be a good book and it's not going to so, be a good book. So, so you wrote this book because somebody told you to write it? Pretty much. That's it. Yeah. Well, and then, and I mean, I wanted to do it, but I just didn't even know where to it's you've read the books, you know, it's very personal and I'm showing you the warts and all there because most of those lessons learned are my lessons learned, which means I failed. Yeah. It wasn't, everything wasn't a success and it's still not, I still, I fail all the time and I learn a lot from that. Um, yeah, but I'm going to fast forward though, Kyle, one of the key reasons why I read a lot, I read probably a book every two weeks and I've done this since college. And one of the reasons why I love this book is because it is so simply written. A lot of folks uh, that have done, you know, run companies, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's, um, it's almost like bombastic reading, like, oh, yeah. this is the 10 things you need to do, blah, 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 blah. This is not, this is, we're going to do simple talking and we're going to talk simply about what it means to be a leader. Um, that's one of the core reasons why I like it. It's just simple and it speaks to anyone fifth grade reading level. You can read this. Um, it's one of the key reasons why I love it. Yeah, and I was, I'll tell you, when the first time I took, um, there's an app called the Hemingway app, and I took some stuff that I'd written, and I dropped it in there, expecting like I'm writing at a, at least a, you know, 12th grade level or something, and it went, yeah, you're writing at like a fourth grade level. I was like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> so then I, then I, I took a speech that President Obama had given, and I highlighted it, and I dropped it in there, and it was like written at you know, second year in college. And then I went back and I read that speech and I couldn't understand. I mean, I literally couldn't understand. I had to look up words and figure out what the heck he was talking about. Yeah. Like you said, when I, I write, I mean, I, I'm a professional writer, so there's a, there's a method to my madness. Yeah. Um, I'm also a professional instructor. And when you instruct people, you have to, you have to get the message across if you are, are causing people to stumble by the way that you present your material, you you're done. Cause yeah. once you lose them, you'll never get them back. Especially yeah. I'm doing, I mean, I'm on the range with these guys for eight hours a day. If I lose them, they're just done. Yeah. So, um, I have learned a lot about writing. I mean, with that book and, and then I've got some other books I've been working on as well, excuse me, but it's, uh, yeah, that was a that was a difficult book to to read, and then there was also some things going on with some of the people I was talking about in the book that they were having struggles, yeah. and I almost thought maybe I shouldn't write this because these guys that are my heroes are now struggling. Well, guess what? They're still my heroes, right. and it took me a while to figure that out. I mean, I was kind of, I hate to say it, but kind of embarrassed. Like, man, I should have picked a different hero. Mm. No, I picked. Yeah the perfect hero because they are still my heroes, even though years later, uh, one of my primary guys in that book had committed suicide. And you want to talk about something that makes you try to figure things out. It's like, this guy was the best, yeah, the best. And I'll leave it at that. I mean, yeah. you can, you can, you can look at it however you want, but yeah. That was, that was definitely a struggle to do that. And the, the other thing too, I don't know if you know uh, kind of where I got that book idea from, but there's a book called Warrior Ethos by Pressfield. Yes. And when I, 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 I read, uh, I, <laughs> I read a lot. I've got, uh, I've got a pretty extensive library. I, I should show you if I can turn this a little bit here. This is my. Yeah. There you go. That's just one of the shelves. And there's, yeah. if I keep going, there's a ladder that takes you up to the top. Oh, wow. So my shelves are like 16 foot tall, full of, of books. That's, I've read most cool. of those. I've got some that are references, but um, so when he wrote that book, he, he, 
I, I read about 10 books at a time now. Normally I was reading like six, but now I'm reading like 10 because I'm studying up for another book that I'm working on. And I've got several research books that I'm reading at the same time too. I do that because once again, I've got that squirrel focus. Yeah. And what that allows me to do is I can stay on it. And once I lose focus, I just go to another book. <laughs> and then I stay focused on that till I lose interest and I go to the next book. Cause some of the books I read, I know you read history. Some of these books are not easy to read oh. like Jordan Peterson, Jordan Peterson. He's a great writer, yeah. but he, Oh my goodness. His stuff is difficult to yeah. read. So it's, it's a struggle to get through some of that. So um, Stephen Pressfield, that book, what I liked about it was I could pick it up and I could read one chapter mm. and one chapter didn't take long to read. And yeah. that chapter was a story. Yep. Now all those stories fit together, but that chapter, you could read that and that could be the only thing you ever read of his yeah. and, and you would have a start and a finish in about six pages. Yeah. So when I wrote this book, I said, I want to have each chapter stand alone. Now it's better if you put them together, yep. but you can pick that book up and you can read just one chapter and you're going to get something out of it. Those chapters are intentionally left not to drag on and, and beat a dead horse. Yeah. I'm going to tell you the information. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you that I'm going to tell you what I told you. And then I'm done. I'm not going to just keep going and going and going. Well, well, that, um, but that's the marketing concept, right? Tell somebody what you want to communicate, tell them again, tell them again, and tell them again. And that's the beauty of this. Um, in one sentence, Kyle, because there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of definitions of leadership out there. Lots. Uh, most of them, most of which I disagree with. What's leadership in one sentence? Leadership is you inspiring others to be successful or at least go in the right direction to accomplish a mission. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I, I totally agree. Um, the other piece that I love that you incorporated is the mission. Um, as somebody who played football, high school, college, somebody who's done a lot of work, both government, private sector, most of the time I'm learning that one of the core elements of my job, which you talk about in your book, is clearly explaining the mission. Yeah. Not yeah. everybody gets that right, man. Yeah, yeah. And and even even those of us that have got it right a few times will then all of a sudden get it wrong. Mm. But that's that's human nature. That's gonna happen. But if we fail. If we fail, I, I can accept failure as long as we learn from that failure. If you don't learn from your failure, then you're, I, I feel very badly for you, like the military. So the military has sustains and improves. When they do an after action or a debrief, they break everything into sustain, which means continue to do that, or improve, which means they need to improve on that. When we would do a hot wash, or a debrief, we did not have sustains. Hmm. We had, what did we screw up and how do we fix that? Oh, interesting. Because we already did the other stuff we did right. Why are we going to sit around and pat ourselves on the back? And that's what a lot of these guys like to do in the regular military. It, it was sickening to listen to their stuff. It's like, no, you guys sucked. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Let's not talk about how great you were I mean, oh, well, you looked good. <laughs> okay, you look good, but you sucked. So, wow. I mean, I look terrible, but I'm going to conduct the mission successfully. Oh. So um, our unit, that, and that is one of the difficulties when we would bring guys on board, getting high performance people to take criticism. That's mm -hmm. difficult, man. Mm -hmm. Very, very difficult. Yeah. But, but if they didn't get to the point where they could take it, they were gone. We let them go because if they couldn't take that criticism. We knew they couldn't be successful on the battlefield because yeah. you've got to be able to be able to uh, be criticized. Now being criticized doesn't mean that you're attacking people. Being critical of somebody means you're trying to help them to be better the next time. And I think that's where some people will get that confused. You know, I always say you can be critical and critique people and you can do it positively. And guys are like, how do you do that? And I go, well, listen to this. You know, David, I was watching you when we were conducting this mission and you were not awesome. Yeah. 
see how that sounds good, but I just told you, you sucked. Yep. And I didn't say it in a mean <laughs> way. And I've had a lot of soldiers that come up to me to go, thanks for telling the guys that. Cause now they keep coming up and saying, man, I was just watching you and you were not awesome. Yep. And, uh, and that's the, you know, the point is we're, we're doing this to make the whole team better. We're not trying to just elevate ourselves or beat our chest. So I love that. I love that. You know, I, there are so many lessons, Kyle, for people to learn from here. Um, understanding a mission, right. When you're, when you're, when you're taught in schools that you're great and not taught how to fail problem one right yeah yeah sort of current generation etc uh participation trophies which you also acknowledge here which i don't support (laughs) the second part of what you're talking about though is also um how do you accept criticism in at a time when things are moving so fast and everybody's told you you're great how do you accept criticism in the context of a mission that you think you're good at um that's hard that's hard. And, and frankly, I don't think it's being taught today widely or being taught well. Yeah. And, and it's something we have to, I, I'm very honest with our students when I teach guys tactics or shooting or whatever. And some of these guys are like, nobody's ever talked to them like this before. Wow. It's like, man, you should have come and played on the football team I played on because my coach had no problem telling us we sucked. Yep. And we ended up being second in the state when I was a junior we went from really, really being bad to being really, really good. And it was because of those coaches, they were, they didn't pull any punches and they worked us like, like dogs, you know? And, and I think in the military, you know, going back to that mission, what is your mission? You know, everybody thinks that a guy like me, all I'm doing is getting up every morning and putting on my, my, you know, black outfit and going out and conducting these, you know, classified missions. That's not it. Yeah. We train and train and train and train and train and train. And we go conduct a mission yeah. and then we come back and we look at how we screwed up on that mission. Even though it was successful, we screwed up. We did something wrong. There's, I, there's always something you can improve on. And then we train and train and train and train again on what we screwed up. And then we go conduct another mission. Yeah. Now we were lucky enough that, you know, in, in Iraq, we might do a hundred missions in 90 days. We might do five different missions in one night man, your learning curve is, is straight up there, but you have a mission you have, and everybody around you has that same mission focus. And I, and that's the thing that I really missed when I first got out of the military Mm. was that I didn't have, I didn't have mission focus. Yeah. Like I, like I had in the military. Well, the reason I didn't have mission focus is because I didn't have a mission. Yeah. So once I, I mean, I did, man, I tried everything. Like I get out of the military and I'm like, oh man, I got to take my watch and I got to put this on civilian time because I'm out of the military now. And then after 24 hours, I'm like, screw that. I don't even know what time it is if I don't leave it on, you know, military time. So I put my watch back on military. I'm a military guy. I'm going to be a military guy until the day I die. That doesn't mean that I have to keep reliving it, but there's certain things I learned in the military that really do work. And one is have a mission and focus on that mission, whatever that mission is. And that's where I see a lot of veterans suffering and then failing is that they don't have a mission. Yep. So what is your mission? And, and the heartbreaking thing is a lot of these soldiers, they'll get out and they're high performance people. They've been very successful in the military. And then all of a sudden, they have no mission. And then they start thinking, well, well, what should I do? And then somebody tells them, well, you know, you just gotta, first thing you got to do is take care of yourself. Yeah. That's the worst thing you can do. That is 100% the worst possible thing that you can do. Because if you're thinking about yourself, you're wrong. You're going to fail 100%. I promise you're going to fail. Now you may think you're you know, for a minute, things are going to look great and you're climbing up and you're getting Instagram followers or whatever. I mean, wow, that's great. They don't pay the bills. So I don't even care who cares about that crap. You know what I mean? Um, If you get some great, if you don't have them, it doesn't matter. What are you doing for other people? If you pick every day, you get up and you try to do something positive for somebody else in your life, you know, what's going to happen. The good Lord's going to bless you tenfold over 
because you're doing what you need to do. If you're sitting there looking in the mirror and thinking, oh, I just got to take care of myself. You're yeah. done, bro. You're so done. It's so over. There's so many people that need your help. There's so many people that you can change their life by just loving everybody. My buddy, Dave Eubank, that's one thing he says, and it's hard to do, you know, and I'm saying this to you, it's easy to say it, yep. but tomorrow morning, I got to get up and go out and do this. Yeah. I'm going to walk out and somebody's going to honk their horn at me and I'm going to be pissed. Yep. And then I got to remember, dang it. I got to love that guy. Yep. And that's just the way it is. That doesn't mean we have to agree with them. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's in our Bible. It's not in everybody's Bible, but in the, the, the Bible that we read and believe, you know, God is love. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's one of the most important things. But so veterans, stop worrying about yourself and yeah. worry about people around you. Yeah. Go, get, go, go help somebody, whoever. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm struggling. I'm an alcoholic. Well, great. Yeah. There's a gazillion alcoholics out there. So yeah. don't drink and go help somebody. Yep. Oh, I'm, I don't have a job. Okay, good. Yeah. Then you got plenty of time to go help people if you ain't got a job. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No question. Um, yeah, but Colin, yeah. it gets to two fundamental principles, right? The first is you have to be taught those core Judeo Christian values to care for people, right? Bible makes it very clear love Christ more than anything else number two love your neighbor more than you love yourself right or as you would love yeah. yourself right yeah so the point is to your second point servant leadership we have to serve others um that has to be taught and uh, i hope that people hear that message from you loud and clear because we're some of us are taught the opposite you come first the individual blah blah blah, blah. No, no 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 one of the key things i love that you talk about here servant leadership serve others serve them well. I love that. Well, yeah. And one other thing too, I want to bring up that you didn't mention there is your family. And I met your wife, you've met Melinda. Yep. I couldn't be successful without my wife. Right. 100% could not. We're very evenly yoked. So a lot of these things I'm telling you, guess where they came from? <laughs> they came right from her because she's trying to make me a better person. Right. And the way that I'm a better person is doing some of these. Th and I mean, it's, this is, uh, I'm a slow learner, but I'm a learner, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to get it. If you just keep, yeah. you know, you keep flogging the horse, I'm going to, I'm going to get head in the right direction. But that, that's the other thing I would, I, I want to make sure that, that guys and gals out there understand that you need to be evenly yoked yes. with your husband or your wife yes. so that you're on the same team, just like dealing with your children. Yeah. You've got to, you, you've, you've got to pre present a united front. Yes. Does that mean that you have to agree on everything? It does not. But when you are faced with your children or other people that you have to, to make a decision with, you need to go behind closed doors, make a decision. And then you are together in that, in that decision. That's hard sometimes. Cause yeah. I mean, I know I drive my wife absolutely bonkers. So I, cause I'm, you know, she's like, now what's on your mind? And I'm thinking, the only thing on my mind right now is hunting. I'm thinking about going <laughs> hunting in Wyoming. And what about your feelings? And I'm thinking my feelings, I feel like I want to go hunting in Wyoming. I can't get off, you know, and then all of a sudden I'll be, well, no, okay. You're right. Colorado mule deer. I need to think about that for a little bit there, you know, so just be women put up with guys like us. Cause we're, uh, we're pretty good dudes. We're just a little out there flapping sometimes. Well, uh, well the, the, another topic you covered toward the end of your book is the importance of home, right? Your wife, your children. And um, one of the things you see, you didn't say it like this, but um, you want to change America, right? Starts at home. You said something like great leadership for our country starts at home in the book. Um, I couldn't agree more, but to your point, that means being a better father, a better husband, a good friend, um, um, loving your wife, loving your children. Um, how, how, how do you talk about that, Kyle? Because um, military folks are serving the country. How, how do you balance that? And how do you talk about that with your colleagues? This might sound terrible, but I'm just gonna say I always say what's on my mind. So I'm going to, I'm going to say it. When you go downrange, I'm not talking about your, 
at Fort Bragg or Fort Benning or wherever, I'm talking about you are conducting a combat mission or you're doing your job for real. Yeah. If you're in the military, your focus, your number one focus has got to be that mission. That doesn't mean that you don't love your family. That doesn't mean that you don't care about your family. But when you're conducting that mission, yeah. you have got to focus on that mission. And then when the mission's over, then you can go see your family if everything, everything goes right. Yeah. If you can't focus on that mission because there's something going on in your family, then you need to go be with your family. Well, you just need to not do the mission. You need to step up to be a man or a woman and say, I can't do this right now. I have got problems at home or whatever, then go take care of your family. But if you're in the arena and you're going against an enemy, you've got to be totally focused on that. And your family hopefully will understand that as long as you then come back to them. Um, I know that sounds terrible. It yeah. really does. But the one thing that doesn't change with that is the first thing we think about in all of that is God. That's right. Because if we, if, if, if he's on our side, yeah. you know, we're going to be pretty successful at whatever yeah. we do. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and success might be that you get killed. Yeah. That's, you know, that could be, that, that might be considered success. Um, people need to kind of, you know, get over that too. Don't think yeah. that, I mean, life is, life is precious, Yeah. but you know, if you've had a good life and you make that ultimate sacrifice, well, yeah. then you've did, you know, I mean, and that's what we're asked to do in the military. That doesn't mean we go in there trying to get killed. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, just have your focus in, in the right in the right direction there. And then when you come home, you need to be with that family. But, but, and, but, and, but, Kyle, but Kyle, so to interrupt you, but, but that means that you have a, a cr incredible partner at home, yeah. right? Because that partner at home, your wife is taking care of the family and she has become your pillar at home. So to your earlier point, there needs to be really solid teamwork between the husband and wife. Yeah. Or you could do like they do in the military. They just keep, trading them out <laughs> you know we melinda and i uh i got invited back to fort bragg one of my awards that i've got years ago got upgraded and uh so there was like 20 of us that got upgraded that day and one of the things that really hit my wife she said there was only like three dudes that still had the same wife wow and one of them was already a retread at the time that that mission happened and they're awesome. They, they, they get along great, but she was already this guy's second wife. And I'm not saying that's bad, but it's man, the military choose marriages up and spits them out. It's, it's so difficult. I, I'll tell you though, for me, if I would have stayed in South Dakota, it would have been way more difficult mm. because in South Dakota, there's other things that you have to deal with. You have relatives, relatives are a pain in the butt. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously they can help you, but they can also really hurt you as well. Yeah. Um, I like the fact that Melinda and I left and we, so we were the support structure for each other. Yeah. It wasn't our families that were, our families basically became, they, they weren't really part of our time there. You know, they very, very rarely would come visit or whatever. Yeah. Um, or something else I was going to say there. Um, oh, and then the other thing in South Dakota, you know, alcoholism is a big deal up there. Everybody's very well trained at drinking in the wintertime because there's nothing else to do. Um, that's not good, you yeah. know. So I, 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 I know for a fact I made the right call because I've been happy ever since. When I graduated from high school, I walked – John Cohen, once again, I'll go back to him. I said, John, make sure you got your camera ready, ready when I walk off the stage. And he goes, why is that boy? And I said, you just have your camera ready. So I walked up to the edge of the stage. I took off that goofy hat that they make you wear. And I pulled out a boonie hat, flipped it out, put it on my head. And I walked off with my boonie hat on. And uh, the funny thing is they asked me this last year, they invited me back to be the commencement speaker for my graduating 
or not my graduating class, but my uh, nephew's son's graduating class. Wow. So that was kind of, that was kind of cool to go back. And that was funny because that's the very first time I've been in that school since I left there. That's cool. I never went back. That's and a, I, now I remember why I didn't want to go back. It made me <laughs> nervous to be there, you know? That's so. hilarious. Hey, Kyle, um, if you, when I, when, when we, when we do the write up for the, for the uh, podcast, et cetera, we're going to talk about your career because it's incredible. But in the context of that, in the conversation we're having, the question I want to ask you is if you were going back home, to talk to a bunch of 12 year olds, what advice would you give them? <laughs> don't do drugs. No, I don't know. <laughs> um, um, I would tell them to write the book that they want to read. Wow. Um, every, every author that I've that I've kind of got, you know, listen to them speak. And if they're trying to instruct somebody, that's one thing that's very common is write the book that you want to read. Yeah. And what I mean by that for those kids is exactly that make, make your life, the life that you would look back on. And as you go through those pages, I'm 12 and now I'm 13. And this is what I did. Mm. Are you proud of that? Mm. I'll tell you right now, I'm not, mm. you know what I'm saying? There's, there's pages. I would like to be like, whoosh, rip that thing out and throw it away real quick before somebody reads what I did when I was, you know, 14 years old or whatever, or when I was 21 or whatever yeah. it might be. So, you know, write the book you want to read. Mm. And, and that, I, I think that should inspire those kids to, to think about what they're doing. That doesn't mean we can't have fun. Yeah. But man, you better be serious about what, what the decisions you make, because a lot of these decisions have, man, the downstream effects are, are crazy. Some of the poor decisions that folks have made just in the heat of the moment, yep. um, whatever that might be. I mean, drinking and driving or playing with a gun or, you know, <laughs> getting a little frisky with your girlfriend when you're yeah. 15 or whatever it might be. I mean, you got to remember that at tomorrow, you're still responsible for what you did yesterday. So I, I think that. that's, that's probably what I would say. I love that advice. My, my older brother, uh, Dan, former police officer, et cetera. Um, he was saying something similar to my two sons this past weekend. Um, they call him Theo, uncle in Spanish, Theo. And my, my brother, Dan says to them, look guys, whatever you do, just make sure you make the right decisions so that you don't look back and say, I wish I had done that differently. And he said it in the context of two of his former colleagues in the police force that made terrible choices and no longer police officers for bad reasons. Um, but I love that. Write the book you want to read. I love that. You know, there's, there's one other thing too, that I would, that I, I'd like to throw in there because my wife and I just had this conversation yesterday. Um, she heard her brother-in-law talking and he said oh yeah i really wanted to do that but insert melinda's sister's name here <laughs> she didn't want me to do it so i didn't do it but i i really wish i could have done that and melinda at that point said kyle will never say that wow so up until this point so far <laughs> in our lives i've done everything that i've wanted to do um there's certain things that I haven't done, but they didn't, they didn't matter. Yeah. Uh, you always hear this term about um, bucket list. Yeah. I don't have a bucket list. Yeah. I don't, <laughs> I've done everything I want to do. If you want to do something, go do it. You poor, poor people that have a bucket list. Yeah. Get, take that bucket, dump it out and, and grab those pieces of paper. I don't know what a bucket list looks like. So may, I'm just making this up as I go, but you, yeah. you just grab a piece of paper and go, I'm going to jump out of an airplane. Okay. Boom. We can do that tomorrow. Yeah. Done. Okay. I want to do this. Well then go to Africa and hunt. Yeah. Oh, I want to go see this river. Then yeah. go to this. I want to go walk on the trails in Machu Picchu. Go do it. Yeah. Go and make that happen. If you don't do it, you're going to have regrets the rest of your life. And then one day a, a guy told me the other day, he said, he got a call from a one of his buddies and he said, you're going to go quail hunting with us. And he goes, 
man, I don't, I, I just don't think I make it. And the guy goes, you at your house, I need to talk to you. So this old guy drives over, he drives in and he goes, I want to put this in perspective. You're 50. The guy's like 55 years old. He said, you're 55. How many quail hunts do you think you have left in you? If you only had 10, wouldn't it make it more important to go quail hunting? Absolutely. If you got 50 of them, then that ain't a big deal. You skip a year, yeah. but start to put things in perspective of what, you know, what kind of time you have left on this awesome planet. And I'm, I'm just the opposite. I've done everything I've wanted to do, man. If I get hit by a, a charging bull tomorrow, that'd be an awesome story. Kyle Lamb gets trampled to death by a Brahma bull or something, <laughs> but I've done everything that I want to do. And yeah. I have no, I have, there's nothing. I mean, is, are there things I want to do, you know, next year? Yeah, for sure. But if I don't do them, it's not something that even matters. You know yeah, what but, I mean? But Kyle, look, how, look, this is one of the things I love about people that built like us, right? There's just like this whole victimhood mentality going on today in society. And I reject it all. I grew up in welfare, man. It's like, no, you can do whatever you want. How, how do we instill that in people, right? The bottom line is they're the only opposite. My coach, uh, my football coach, Dave Dempsey, who you met at the breakfast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, always said the only obstacle, the only person in your way is the person in the mirror. Look at that person. That's your obstacle. How do we inspire and instill those values in people, Kyle, especially today? Yeah, you're doing it. You're already doing it. You're doing it with your, with your boys. You have, to, you have to look at your sphere of influence. What is that? Yeah. I look around and I think about my son. My son is successful, Christian, conservative, good dude. Yep. Um, my daughter, yep. maybe not. She's conservative in some ways. She might not be conservative in yep. other ways, but she's very successful. She's tracked down more terrorists than I ever have. Um, she's super yep. successful. I look down the road, my buddy, his son just signed up for the military. His wow. daughter's been talking to me about, she wants to go in the military and be a nurse. Wow. Okay. You're doing it. You keep, yeah. you, you influence the people around you. If, if all you influence are your children yep. and a few of your neighbor's kids, you've done your job. If everybody were to do that, if we would just say, okay, I'm a dad, I need to make sure my kids are squared away. And, and, and mine, I can credit my wife because I was gone a lot, but my wife did a great job. Yeah. But if you can inspire these other kids, <laughs> kids are awesome. I mean, they're kids in America right now. They're no different than kids were a hundred years ago. They're not, yep. you know, there's all this crap. I mean, they may be smarter than we were, but they're not, lazy they're none of that stuff yeah it's it's us as parents that if if we're if our kids aren't working hard enough that's on you yep. get them working harder totally agree if, uh, yeah and, and the other thing too that you you said it earlier about shop class i think that a, a struggle that we have is we've we've made up pretend importance mm. like being an academic well what does that mean yeah. Is just going to college, does that make you an academic? No, that means you went to college. That doesn't mean you're actually smart. That doesn't mean you actually learned anything. And heaven forbid, if everybody went to college, was an academic, because then our world would suck. Um, <laughs> where do you really need to go to learn to be successful? If you want to be a philosopher, then I suppose you go to college and you study the philosophy, all the Greek and Roman philosophers or whatever. I haven't seen anybody that has the, the term philosopher on their card uh, that's handed that to me that's been successful with that. But where, where people can be successful is if they get a real job. So like uh, Mike Rowe, he's got Rowe Works and he gets people to get yeah. real jobs. And that means a real job means you have to work and yeah. then you get paid. If you don't have a real job, you're not going to get any money and you're going to get welfare. And that's going to run out. So these kids that are thinking that's the way of the future, it's, it's not going to happen. So get a real job, get a, even my son, he has a, uh, he went for film, got a film degree at UNC Wilmington. And he, he does work in his field. I mean, he does photography, he does some film stuff, and then he works, works for Viking tactics as well. Um, but when he went to film, it was, well, let's analyze these films. Yep. 
it wasn't it wasn't practical like let's go make a film yeah and i think you know even in there that's that's too bad because that's not that's not what these kids are signing up for if you sign up for a welding class they will teach you how to weld yep. and you're going to make if you sign up to be a welder you're going to make as much as a doctor makes no question and and your schooling is going to be two years instead of you know six years. No Nothing wrong with doctors. I'm 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 totally supportive of that. But um, get a real job. Get a yeah, real one, job. One I love how you're saying it. The way I I say it, Kyle, is I I try to give people a little bit more clarity. I tell people, look, uh, especially college age folks who come to me for advice. I say, look, you've got to get either a job where you're creating value that people want to pay for, right? So have a skill or a trade that people are going to pay for, or B, start a company that people whose pe that people want the product. Yeah. Um, so I love your comment because I, I totally agree. Um, if you want to be a dancer, that's fine, but you better make sure you're the best dancer in the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, Kyle, I, I, um, I ask everyone that I talk to on the podcast this question um, as a wrap up. Um, take your time if you want to answer it. Um, I like to ask people, what is your purpose? My, I, my purpose has changed over the years. Mm -hmm. And I think it, if, if you're on the right track as a man, I, I can't speak for women because I don't understand women. I can't tell you what they're <laughs> thinking, but as a man, I think that my purpose has changed from what it was when I was 18 yeah. to 25 to 30. And I'm 54 as of a few weeks ago. Um, my purpose now is to make other people better. Mm. So how can I do that? We already talked about serving other people. That's going to make them better. Spreading the good news. And the good news can be whatever you want it to be. The good news can be, you know, talking about faith. The good news can be uh, teaching people how to shoot better. The good news can be teaching people about leadership, yep. but spread the good news. And I think that's the purpose of, of uh, what I'm doing. And that applies all across my life. So I've got two grandkids and you want to talk about awesome having grandkids is, I mean, kids are cool, but grandkids are way, way better than your own kids. And that's something that we're enjoying now. And that's that, that's the, my purpose is to make them better as well. Wow. And me being angry and grumpy and not playing with them or not, I mean, that doesn't make them better. So if you're trying to have purpose, make, make everybody better. I love it. Sergeant Major, thank you for your service. Thank you for spending so much time with us. Um, blown away by the discussion. Thank you for joining Grip Machine DNA. We have to do this one again. Uh, oh, yeah. For everybody listening and watching, um, um, man, you've done so many things. I'm gonna wrap up by saying this, uh, this man has served our country in incredible ways. He's an author of Leadership in the Shadows among other books. Um, he's also founder CEO of several companies. Viking Tax is one of them. I am a client. Uh, Kyle, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. It was an honor to have you with us today. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. And please uh, give my regards to your wife and your family. Si vives día a día en un abismo de dolor y busca solución a tus problemas, busca del Señor y sigue su camino y pronto nacerá la paz en tu corazón. Y con la paz del Señor yo he vencido mi temor yo vivo victorioso por su amor y con la paz del Señor que he vencido mi temor y yo vivo victorioso por su amor si vives día a día en un abismo de dolor y 
busca solución a tus problemas. Busca del Señor y sigue su 